In 1347, a Genoese trading ship fled from the Near East and landed in Sicily. And out in the eastern parts where they had been trading, there had been a war. And it was a war that had been ravaged by the plague. And at one point, the besieging army had catapulted the dead bodies of those who had died from the plague over the city walls in order to affect those on the inside. And so these Genoese ships fled, roughly 12 in number. And when they landed in Sicily, they themselves, though they didn't know it at the time, brought with them the plague. And though the subject is controversial, a number of historians believe that these Genoese ships brought the plague from the east back with the rats that were stowed away on the ships hiding out that had carried the fleas that carried the bubonic plague and other types of plague with them. And as a result, the plague landed in the West. And it was not the first time that the plague had come. We noted earlier during the lectures on the Byzantine world that in 541 and 542, there was the Justinian plague. And the Justinian plague is, we believe, the first at least notable and credible outbreak of the plague to affect the Near Eastern world. But as the plague came over from the Near East and as it spread through the West, no one could foretell the destruction and the horror that it would bring and the way that it would ravage the West, kicking off nearly two centuries of population decline, destroying economies, ruining kingdoms, and overturning so much of what the medieval world considered to be the everyday way of life. And so in this lecture, we're going to look at the Black Death, which is a period of time between 1347 and 1351, which marks the beginning of the real horror of the plague as it came to the West. And we're going to note not only the plague, how it came, how it spread, how people died from it, but we're also going to note the cultural shifts and changes and the economic shifts and changes and the changes to the church and to religious life that were brought about by the plague in the West. And to begin with, we have to talk about the context of the plague. What happened just prior to the plague coming to the Western world? Well, in our lecture on the Three Estates, we noted that there was, in the High Middle Ages, something called the Little Optimum. And that is a time in the Middle Ages when the average temperature rose by several degrees, sparking widespread population booms, harvest booms, and all kinds of spreading of numerical and economic strength throughout much of the Western world. And those were good times. That was the golden age of the Middle Ages. But as a result of the Little Optimum, historians have always noted that there was also a population boom that put massive strain on the supply chains and on production for food and merchandise throughout the region. Though there had been some technological changes, we talked about the three-field system, and we talked about the inclusion of a new yoke around the neck of the oxen that allowed for more widespread farming and these kinds of things. And though all of these things seemed to sync up at just the right time, in the end, by the time of the early 14th century, the population density in most of the arable land had reached its max. And so what we see happen is peasants and farmers and landholders begin to move out into the periphery. They have to, at one point, begin to farm and till and cultivate land that is actually not the best for farming. Harsher land, denser land, more rocky soil, these kinds of things. And at some point, the demand for food created such a strain, particularly in the south, particularly in the Mediterranean regions, but also in the north. But the population boom created such a demand for food and for merchandise that the economy began to fluctuate rapidly as a result. At times, there was a lack of harvest. Areas sometimes ran out of food or of certain kinds of food. And even worse, if the crops should fail, if there should be disease or lack of rain or whatever it might be, the calamitous result of more mouths to feed and less food to feed them created widespread famine. And so in the late 1300s and in the early 1400s, we actually see a number of famines that spread throughout the Western world. If there's not a famine, at times we see prices rise and fall. The inflation of the demand is pretty extraordinary. Now, for those on the low levels, those who are farming, this is actually a good thing. You're making more money, more profit, off of the same amount of work you were doing just a generation or two before. 
And we'll talk a little bit later about the impact of this on the lower classes, because as inflation rises, so too does the material wealth of those on the lower rungs. It's the wealthy, frankly, who have to pay through the nose for these things. And more importantly, the little optimum ended. And not only did the little optimum end and the average temperature of Europe drop back down to previous levels, but there was actually sparked something that we today call a little ice age. Suddenly, it got colder. And just as dramatically as the medieval warm period had caused so much crop boom, now the little ice age, harder winters, more crops dying over the winter seasons. Harvest is shrinking, or at least being runted, being much smaller, and even those that you are harvesting being of a smaller variety and not as rich and plump. What begins to happen is you see a restriction on the goods and the foodstuffs that are available to the populace. And though we are actually at a loss for knowing exactly how all of this affected the spread of the plague, it stands to reason, and therefore most historians buy into this concept, that what happens is with famine, with the reduction of calories and the ability for people to eat regularly, and with the new harsh winters that were coming in, the spread of the plague hit Europe at just the right time, so that those who contract the plague may have had weaker immune systems, may have been less hardy, and therefore were more susceptible to receiving the virus if bit by the fleas that carried it. Whatever the case, when the plague comes in 1347 or thereabouts, it spreads like wildfire throughout all of Western Europe. And there seems at times to be no area that is untouched by it. Now, of course, urban centers with their dense population are hit hardest, but the plague knew no boundaries. In fact, it spread to rural areas and towns and villages and farms all throughout Europe as a whole. Well, where does the plague come from? Put simply, the plague comes from Asia, perhaps the region of Mongolia or certain regions of modern-day China. Scientists very recently, in fact, just several years ago, were able to, through DNA tests, determine the virus strand that brought many of the elements of the plague over and by discovering that, they were able to determine that it actually had come from Asia. And what happened was, is it began to spread through Asia and ravage that part of the world. It then moved, as they say, along the Silk Road, moving through India, across the steppes, and then down into Asia Minor. And what was interesting is because of the trading ships that went from east to west, the west knew this was coming. It did not shock them when it was coming. In fact, if anything, they were horror-stricken, those who knew of the plague that was on its way. And when the plague landed, it actually had three different varieties of it. Most of us are aware of something called the bubonic plague. And the bubonic plague gets its name from the dark swelling that would happen usually under the armpit, sometimes around the neck. And these were called buboes. And as a result, the bubonic plague gets its name and what would happen with the bubonic plague is it would strike, and for several days, the person that had contracted it would have intense agony and vomiting and these large buboes growing on their body, and then eventually they would die. However, there were two other types of plague as well. There was the pneumonic plague. It was a plague that affected the lungs. It brought a lot of coughing. It was more internalized in terms of its effects, and it would be nearly as painful as the bubonic plague but it would take you out as well. And there was a third, the septicemic plague. And of course, septicemic refers to the blood. It was a plague that attacked the blood, and it was very intense and very painful. But as these things go, in many ways, the septicemic plague was the most merciful. Often the person would be dead within a few hours, at least within the same day. And so a number of varieties of plague hits Europe. And they come along from Asia not by spreading of coughing or of any types of proximity to other humans, but most historians and most scientists are of the opinion, but it was spread by a certain flea that would attach itself to rats. And this was a robust flea. It could survive in a number of different climates. And because of the virus that it carried, which didn't kill the flea, it would very quickly kill the animal that it fed off of. And eventually these fleas turned to humans and began biting humans and spreading the plague that way. And so we know a good deal more about the plague now due to our advances in science and technology and our ability to understand the way viruses work. For those living in the 14th century, though, this was a scourge from God. 
There was simply no way for them to understand or to get their mind around this silent killer, this immense killer. We know in general the number of the population that died throughout the world, stretching from Asia to Europe, somewhere in the neighborhood of 450 to 500 million people died. It was a pandemic, as we say. It took out large populations in just about every place of the known world. In Europe, the population decline was staggering. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 percent of everyone living in Europe died. It is almost impossible to get our imagination around this. Mass graves in cities. No time to bury the dead, simply throwing the bodies and the carcasses away into these graves and then burying them as fast as possible for fear that the plague itself would somehow be spread by these bodies that are being left behind. Doctors, those who are at least believed to know something about the human body and how to heal it, having absolutely no capacity to understand or to grapple or to wrestle with this plague. Religious leaders having no answer for why this was afflicting them. Put simply, this was one of the most psychologically traumatizing moments in all of human history. We can look at just one city as an example. Take the city of Florence. Prior to the plague, Florence had roughly 120,000 people in it. So right about the time of 1300, Florence was 120,000 strong. By the year 1420, just 120 years later, the population of Florence has dropped to 30 or 40,000. Now again, try to wrap your mind around this. A city that has the capacity, that has the infrastructure, that has the buildings and the spaces and the living for 120,000 people reduced to 30 to 40,000. We have all kinds of accounts and letters of empty buildings, shops no longer being worked, bellows and furnaces and blacksmiths sitting cold. Those who worked in the cities and those who worked on the farms now gone, suddenly, almost seemingly overnight in some places. The rapid decline of the population, in fact, is so precipitous that it utterly collapses the economy of many areas of Europe. At the very least, it puts such a strain on it that goods and products are simply not being manufactured. Harvests are not being taken in, new crops not being planted. Those who have surplus have nowhere to sell it. It is simply calamitous throughout Europe. And in fact, though we have said that the plague in this case is from 1347 to 1351, in fact, the plague keeps returning again and again and again over the centuries. But the plague continues to come back to Europe and other parts of the world until roughly the late 1800s. But in this case, in the 14th century, it is the worst. Again, half a billion people are lost on the planet over the course of a decade or a number of years. There is no accounting for that in our mind's eye. There is no way to understand the impact on that ourselves from this far of a distance. So how did the result of this Black Death, this plague, affect those in Europe? Well, we can notice two different trajectories of change in Europe. One more in the temporal realm, in the economics and in the social life, and the other in the religious life. In the temporal life, in day-to-day -day living in existence, those who survived the plague suddenly found themselves in a new world. One of the more interesting effects of the Black Death is that many of the societal structures that had been in place during the population boom were now either suspect or they were cast aside in general. So, for example, serfdom. When the population decreases rapidly, suddenly the demand for labor is skyrocketed. There are fewer laborers, there are fewer people to do the work that is required, and therefore those at the lower rungs of society and at, say, the mid-level, lower to middle class, have incredible bargaining power with those who are in power. They don't necessarily have to put up with the old system. If the lords need the work, then why should the peasants put up with harsher taxes or with poor labor practices? Now, we did say at our lecture on the medieval life that tenure was the way to look at serfdom, that peasants in many ways and workers and farmers liked the serfdom system because it guaranteed them a spot. But, again, the issue there was the overpopulation of much of Europe, the lack of good jobs within a certain region of where you grew up. Now, however, if there is possibility of moving around mobility, you could take a job here versus there, you don't have to put up with some of these practices, suddenly 
The opinion swayed the other way. Suddenly serfdom was not to be tolerated. Suddenly peasants didn't like this. One of the things that the nobility does, however, is they attempt to reimpose serfdom in a pretty harsh manner. A number of policies are passed where people are tied to the land more aggressively. Taxes skyrocket. And it was a poor decision by those in power, but their decisions were based on the idea that they needed to ensure stability. We've seen this sometimes in antiquity where a king, during a particular moment of crisis, will freeze wages and freeze prices. Well, anyone with a basic understanding of economics knows if you freeze prices and freeze wages, all you're going to do is create a black market and you're going to kill the supply and demand chain. That too often controlling it, particularly in the Middle Ages and the ancient world, means that you end up ruining it. And so the peasants and the middle class in general were not very happy with the results of the Black Death in terms of their outlook and their prospects in labor. And there were two other things going on that began to cast a dark cloud over Europe as a whole. This same period of time is the century of the Hundred Years' War, which we're going to look at in a later lecture. In fact, the Hundred Years' War began just 10 years before the Black Death struck. It began in 1337. And the war was ruinous, even more so, between England and France. Another major factor that was shaping the opinions of Europe as a whole was the two-stage crisis in the Catholic Church, known as the Avignon Papacy and the Papal Schism. Again, we're going to have lectures on both of those pieces at a later date. But you have to realize that the Avignon Papacy, when the papacy is moved to France and it resides there, and subsequently the split and the schism, where at one point you have two popes and later a third pope added to the mix, really cast doubt on the moral integrity and the leadership of the papacy and the Catholic Church. And so from a social perspective in general, the Black Death really opens Pandora's box. The peasants, the middle class, don't have to put up with things, and more importantly, the leadership at all levels is simply not doing its job. It is doing a poor job in maintaining the crisis. And so, as a result, during the 14th century, we have several of the most important peasants' uprisings in the medieval world. And these uprisings are, just as they sound, they are popular revolts, they are peasants, or in the case of Italy, guildsmen, rising up to attempt to either demand certain changes to the structures of society, or, more aggressively with some, to overthrow the nobility entirely. Now, we say peasants' war, and it's very often that we can believe in our mind's eye that these are simply peasants running around willy-nilly, just kind of wreaking havoc everywhere. In fact, these revolts in general were a lot more structured, and very often they would have a number of nobility and clergymen and these kinds of things who would be on the side of the peasants and who would galvanize and organize the revolt. And the two we should mention are the 1378 Guild Revolt in Florence, and a 1381 Peasants' Revolt in England. Now, we're going to discuss the Peasants' Revolt in England a little more extensively in our lecture under John Wycliffe. But we should note now that it was right in this same period of time. And that revolt was specifically related to heavy taxation as the king and the nobility taxed the peasants and taxed the lords and the manors extremely aggressively, doubling and tripling the tax rents sometimes over the span of just two or three years. And they did this in order to pay for the Hundred Years' War and also for the ravages of the plague. But those who were peasants suddenly found themselves with less, and they revolted. The one we want to look at a bit more in depthly, though, is the Guild Revolt in Florence, 1378. And the Guild War was essentially a struggle by those within the guilds to break out of the system and to challenge those who were trying to put straitjackets around the whole process. What happened in the guild system is suddenly the cost to become a master skyrocketed. Those who were allowed into the guild were restricted. And this, at times, forced those who normally should have had access to the guilds to go, really, put themselves into a serfdom position on the manors. In other words, the crisis of the Black Death and the lack of demand caused the guilds to contract. And because they contracted, 
what began to happen is the Florentine guilds began to put pressure internally on themselves to keep some people out that should perhaps have had access in. Also, the guild structures themselves were having struggles with the ruling classes in Florence. And so, in 1378, there was a revolt. It eventually was put down, but the revolt was pretty calamitous for Florence, already reeling from the population decline, as we've mentioned earlier. Now, if that's the temporal or the economic or the social impact of the Black Death, what about the religious impact of the Black Death? Put simply, after the 14th century and after the result of the Black Death, historians have always noted that what happens to the religion of the Catholic Church is it becomes, for lack of a better word, darker. It becomes more concerned with the issue of death. Some of the excesses of the Catholic Church that we associate with the medieval period actually only begin to arise at this time in the 14th century. Take, for example, the rise of something called the flagellation movement, which is a movement in which penitent people seeking to assuage God's anger for the Black Death began going around in public procession, whipping themselves on the back. And they would carry these whips around and in a public display of penance, they would whip themselves often to bloody excess. We see also in the 14th century extensive concern with penance in general, this desire to get the plague behind them by everyone confessing. In art, historians have also noted that when the Catholic Church begins to create art in the late Middle Ages, as a result, what you see is a number of changes in the, frankly, the tone and the style. There is, for example, something developed called the dance macabre, a style of art that is loosely translated as the dance of death, in which very often you see someone confronted with skeletons, with the very real possibility of death, dancing, laughing, almost mockingly in front of them. We also see in art at this time an increased focus on the death of Christ, particularly the sufferings of Christ. We see art where Christ is being brought down off the cross, lying dead and lifeless. And you can only imagine that those who had seen so many lifeless bodies in the later Middle Ages as a result of the Black Death saw in this an identity of Christ with our death. And the religious elements are shaped in particular because the church is fractious at this point. It is broken. It is at one point in the Avignon papacy. It is taken away from Rome. It seems to be weakened. It seems to be co-opted by the French government. And then later, as it breaks up into three different groups, it seems as if the papacy does not have an answer or as if it does not have the moral authority to answer the call of the Black Death and of the resultant collapse of the economy and of the society throughout Europe. And so, in the end, the Black Death ravaged Europe. It killed the population in staggering numbers, 50 or 60 percent. It caused widespread social change, economic disaster, crisis. And, given that this is a time when the papacy was particularly weak and the kingdoms of Europe were at war, what ends up happening is the tone of Europe begins to take a downward turn. The darkness sort of seems to come upon Europe, metaphorically speaking. There is now this tone of pessimism that is seeping into the bloodstream of Europe after the High Middle Ages and the Golden Age. And it is this downward trend, this darkening, this concern, that leads to changes in the Catholic Church and changes in society that will have an effect all the way down until the Reformation. Mm-hmm.